everybody. Nice to see um, Dr. Lebris' class here, uh, e-commerce Ryan, right? Yeah. Class right. and uh, Dr. Godek's class. Intro to what? Purpose and practice Purpose of practice. business. Wonderful to see you all here today. Thank you for coming to the uh, Dean Speaker Series on our campus. We do this once uh, every quarter. And the reason we do it is that we're about preparing leaders like you, budding leaders like yourself in business, government, and economics for the purpose of serving the world uh, with the goal of having you and folks flourish along uh, every dimension. And so we're really excited to introduce Joe Winnie here today uh, from uh, the former uh, founder of, he was the founder, he's not the former founder, founder of Theo Chocolates. Now, um, who's got a favorite Theo chocolate bar? What do you reckon? Who had a Theo chocolate bar this week? Yeah, what kind? The salted almond. Isn't that oh, awesome? Yeah. That's I love that stuff. Yeah, so I, I look for it to be on sale, the two for one, Joe. <laughs> yeah, go to Bartels one week, you know, uh, Curacy the next week. But it is awesome chocolate. They are just uh, located over in Fremont. But let me, tell me, let, let me tell you a little bit about Joe's story before we invite him to speak to you today. But um, Joe is very passionate about organic and fair trade uh, sourcing of product. Um, and the particular product that he got excited about was the cocoa bean. And so he has a wonderful purpose in his business, and I don't know whether you're discussing this in your purpose and practice of business, but you ask the question, what, what is the purpose of business, right? Is it to just make money? Is it to uh, serve the community? Is it to help everyone thrive uh, in the community? Well, Joe decided that was his idea of Theo's chocolates, that right across the supply chain and the value chain of the, co of the cocoa bean right through to the bar of chocolate, everyone should thrive along that supply chain. And so that's why he started uh, Theo's Chocolates. He sources, uh, the, the company sources most of their product from the Democratic Republic of Congo, the DRC, um, and then some from Peru and other places around the world, and then there are lots of other products that they infuse that salt, right? I think the salt comes from the Northwest, Joe. Uh, yes, it does, actually. Yeah, there you go. Sure. Um, so really interesting supply chain, but where, whoever they deal with, wherever they get their, source their product, they're looking for folks who uh, are, are going to, there's going to be mutual benefit for their suppliers and, and for Theo's chocolates. Um, so it's a terrific company, and Joe got into this because he was an adventurer. He's an entrepreneur. He started to kind of cruise the world, particularly in Central America and places like that, in Africa, and he saw um, farming. He saw uh, where products come from and how people farm and the communities they come from, and he wanted to honor those communities as he developed and built his business. So in 2006, um, uh, we, Joe founded uh, with, uh, Theo's Chocolates. Uh, since 1994, he'd been bringing in product from uh, different places of the world around the idea of fair trade and organic. Um, so he's got a deep uh, love for um, his business, for the people involved in his business, for everyone uh, who supplies his business, for all aspects of the folks involved in his business. So sustainability is a big word for him. He really believes it and uh, tries to live that out through his various entrepreneurial ventures. Um, he left uh, Theo's last year um, and now is looking at the next entrepreneurial uh, venture. So we might get an inside scoop today for the next bar of chocolate, so to speak, okay? What that might look like uh, for us and, and for the world. Now, he's been involved in a lot of uh, organizations, including Net Impact, which uh, looks at uh, interesting technology solutions around the world, um, World Cocoa Foundation. Uh, Seattle University School of Business, he gets involved on the advisory board um, and has just been on a lot of panels. I first heard him speak at Global Washington, um, which is an international, uh, which is a uh, convening organization here in, in the state of Washington around uh, 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 sustainability issues, around global development, that kind of thing. The other cool thing for us is that being a school of business, government, and economics, Joe always works at that nexus of that relationship between government, civil society organizations, and business. And it's very much a believer in what we say about business, another way of doing business, right? A business for a purpose other than just 
uh, making profits. Um, the other thing that's kind of cool is that with this initiative around the sustainability issues, our kind of emphasis here at our business school along the sustainable, with the sustainable development goals, I don't know whether you've been seeing those come through in your classes, is a really big push and Joe's a strong believer in uh, looking at some of these big issues in the world and seeing business solutions that might, might be effective. So uh, without any further ado, I'd like to invite Joe to come on up and, uh, and tell us a little bit about uh, himself, about Theo's maybe, and about some of his new ventures. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. Pleasure to have you. Um, good morning. How are you guys? Do you want some chocolate? Because I have to correct the fact that only a couple people have had a Theo chocolate bar this week. So I'm going to uh, probably ask for a little bit of help. I have, um, I think I have five different flavors. Do you mind if I just take a little bit of time and hand it out now? Sure. All right. Now, but there's only uh, one. If you don't want, you might want them to, they might eat them. Though. That's great. And so if you do eat them, then what I need to hear about is what you like or what you don't like about it. And I have a couple things here that are a little surprising. Um, all right. So the... So I have um, some dark, 70% dark chocolate bars. Who would like some of those? And can somebody help me hand out? Oh, good. You want to help me hand them out? Thanks. <laughs> see what happens when you say yes? <laughs> what you can do is just figure out how to open that. Sure. Have fun. OK. Um, so there's another flavor. Has, has anybody, have you been to the Theo factory? Okay, so a handful of folks. Um, we, had, we launched last year some new flavors, and one of them is a root beer barrel chocolate. Who would like to try that? Oh, good. Yeah, see? I'm going to get everybody to raise their hand eventually, I promise. And then hand them out to other, other suspecting victims. We have, um, we have a milk chocolate. It's a cinnamon horchata which is really, like, ridiculous. <laughs> How about a hazelnut crunch? Here you go. Um, bread and chocolate. Bread and chocolate. Oh, Mark, here you go. Does everybody have a chocolate bar? Does everyone have a chocolate bar? Yeah? Does anybody not? I guess maybe that's a better question. No, okay, I guess we're in good shape. Um, all right, so the only thing that I ask is that, um, that at any time you feel moved to share your opinion with me, either during the presentation or after. And just so you know, I like, sort of, I like casual conversation. So I'm gonna share my story with you, uh, but if you have questions um, about anything, just you know, feel free to raise your hand and I'll definitely call on you. We're gonna leave a little bit of time for Q&A at the end, but I'm really happy to answer as we go along. Uh, so, uh, the, as, as the Dean shared, there's the, Theo came out of my own personal desire to not just make stuff for money, but to really help have positive impact around the world. Money only goes so far. Money is not, you know, it's cliche, money's not happiness. Money, to me, is always about fuel to go out and do the things that you really want to do. And I believe strongly in having a positive impact. I had learned um, when I was very young that uh, enlightenment without engagement is dead spirituality. You know, if we have the ability and the awareness to do something positive in the world and we don't exercise that, then we're not really, in my humble opinion, not really living to our full potential. And so when I was, um, when I was a teenager, I uh, decided that it would be a really good idea to protest the education system. I was in a, this public school that wasn't doing a great job. I was senior class president and I quit. And I was like, I'm going to show them. And then I realized nobody cared. <laughs> and so I carried on, and I, but I wanted to have adventure. So as I um, moved out into the world, I bought a beat up old sailboat with a friend of mine, and we went sailing to Central America, where I fell in love. And this is in the late 80s, early 90s. And that part of the world was so, seemed so remote to me at the time. And uh, I fell in love 
with the people there and I decided to volunteer for a small conservation foundation that was doing two things. One was um, working with indigenous minds, learning how they interact with their environment in positive ways. And this was before a real cash economy had encroached. And also um, collecting plants from the rainforest, because that part of the forest uh, was above the Crustacea Sea, which made it very unique and special. There were things growing there that you couldn't find anywhere else in the world, some potential medicine. And there, were the, there was a um, uh, serious threat of logging. And so this group, we would do rainforest expeditions to collect plants and to propagate them to try to preserve the genetics. And I was just a strong back. I didn't go to college. I, I already told you I dropped out of high school. But I was passionate about doing important things in the world. And so uh, the, the experience that I had there was so formative. And the, the farmers, the, the mines I worked with, the far, they're primarily cocoa farmers. And cocoa uh, was first really, truly domesticated by Mayans a couple millennia ago. And they... Um, and they used cocoa in a way that was very much a part of their identity and who they were. And it was hard not to fall in love with this tree, which was beautiful. My very first time out into um, a cocoa farm. And you have to understand, I grew up in Philadelphia. As far as I knew, cocoa came from Switzerland. And I had no idea that it was a tropical crop. I don't know, has anybody been to a cocoa farm? And so, okay, so you've seen, the, you've seen the pods growing on the tree and inside. So chocolate is made out of the seeds of the cocoa tree, which is Theobroma cacao, which is where the name Theo came from eventually. And um, the, the, the pods are cut off the limb of the tree and they're the size of a small football. And if you wanna go on the Theo factory tour, you'll learn a lot about this stuff too. And the seeds are scooped out and they are fermented and then dried and then chocolate's made from that. So my very first day I show up and I'm volunteering and they say, okay, will you go with these guys and harvest cocoa? And they handed me this rice sack with um, uh, shoulder straps made out of an old car seatbelt and a shotgun and say, go, go with these guys. And I thought, well, do we shoot the cocoa? I mean, how does this work? And off we go and the cocoa is growing um, underneath this canopy in the forest. And it was, it was absolutely gorgeous and beautiful. Howler monkeys and toucans and these trees with huge giant buttress roots. It looked like something out of Dr. Seuss. It was really magical. And um, my job was to chase the pods. It was very hilly. So the farmers would cut the pods off the tree and they'd roll all over the place. And I had to run around and gather them up and pile them. And I went to reach for one pod and there was this huge snake, a, a fer de lance, which is called a yellow jaw. And I had no idea that it was dangerous. Apparently it's one of the most dangerous snakes in Latin America because not only is it poisonous, but it's um, aggressive, it's territorial, and it hunts in pairs. And so I had this notepad in my belt. I took it out to write down, you know, I'm observing a snake, and I asked Chapin, the guy who was running the crew, I said, Chapin, what kind of snake is this? And all he did was like, get the gun, boy, get the gun. I was like, now I know what the gun is for. <laughs> and that was my first day in the chocolate industry. And and the, you know, and I'll tell you some more stories and other adventures that I've had, but what was so clear to me after spending um, several months in these communities and what turned out to be kind of a volunteer stint for a few years was that social environmental degradation were business issues because fa these farmers would grow cocoa, sell the, some of their cocoa as a way of make, meeting some of their needs, and as the cash economy encroached, they had school fees, suddenly the town had electric bill, which it didn't have before. And they started to make some very, very land or, or, or poor land stewardship decisions just to pay the bills and compromising some their beliefs and compromising their the way that they had been stewarding the landscape for, for so long. And it seemed like there had to be a better way. Like if they could just earn a little bit more money for what they were producing, everything would be so much better. And so I looked at the... Um, the chocolate market, and this was in the late 80s, early 90s, and at the time, I mean, you know, you think about chocolate as brown, cheap, sweet candy, and there's really not a lot of value in there. You have to understand the cocoa originally was a sacrament, right? It was something that was so valuable, it was currency, 
not just for the Mayans, but also for Aztecs and, and other societies in Latin America. Um, it was something that the, only the, the priests and the, the kings and the royalty could actually have access to. It was so valuable, and we went from that to something that was so incredibly cheap that just growing it was um, almost ec economically oppressive for the producers. So I had a little mechanical typewriter. I thought, well, I'm going to change the game. The organic food business at the time was a billion dollars, all of North America. And I was like, that's huge. Of course, I had no idea that it wasn't really very much, but I was like, Everybody's going to want organic chocolate. There's no organic chocolate. The organic consumers value the um, environmental production of cocoa. They, they're paying a premium for it. This is going to be absolutely fantastic. So I figure if I can just hook up the farmers with a chocolate maker, then everything would be fine and I could carry on doing my work and, and, not, and not have to be so concerned about the future of these communities that were important to me. So I had a little mechanical typewriter, wrote a letter to all, but there were about 10 chocolate makers in North America at the time. One wrote back and said, um, you know, we'd love to talk to you about making organic chocolate. And I thought, that's great. So I show up and they were in Brooklyn, New York. And at the time they were in bankruptcy and I didn't know this. And they said, well, if you bring us cocoa beans and sugar and milk powder, and by the way, bring us customers, we'd love to make organic chocolate. And I figured, well, how hard can that be? So I did it and um, brought in uh, Newman's Own Organics, which was a burgeoning brand at the time, Cascadian Farm and, and a few other brands, and started this business that I wasn't really intending to do. It's just that nobody else would do it. And I thought, well, if I really want to make change, and that grew into a, an operation that spanned Europe, um, North America. We had offices in uh, Central America and also building supply chains in Africa. And it was clear to me that the business that I had built didn't have a very strong business foundation. At the time, it was exciting because we had tremendous top line growth. And in the 90s, um, and it feels a little bit similar to today actually, where the, there is so much money going into products and brands and technology that even if the businesses aren't sound, they still can attract funding. And so that I, it was easy for me to attract money, especially from foundations who were willing to support the kind of work that I really believed in. But the, where the foundation of this business was weak is that I was taking all of the risks. So in many cases, especially in West Africa, um, pre-financing a harvest, and because no one else would do it, right? So I, would, I was pre-financing the harvest, bringing in the cocoa to the United States, paying a manufacturer to produce it, sometimes two manufacturers to produce a finished product, and then selling that to a brand who would then go sell it to retailers um, around the country. And in that, in that, there were two primary problems. One is the cash churns for those business students. The cash churns were two times a year. So for if you're not in a business class, the, the amount of time you take your capital and convert it to sales and invest it and get a return on that, the more liquid your business is, the less risk you have, the healthier you are in general. The other thing I didn't have was anything proprietary. I didn't own manufacturing. I didn't have any intellectual property or IP, no brand, consumer brand. And so I'm taking all the risk without having really the protection of, of those, of those um, assets. And that's where Theo came from. It was clear that if I wanted to, oh, and the other part about it is that there was so much downward pressure on price and that there were all of these organizations, including myself, kind of in the middle of needing to take a margin out <coughs> that to actually return value to the farmers and while kind of ensuring that we're able to pay for the value add of the product made it almost impossible for me to have a cash flow positive business and to really deliver the kind of economics that I knew were necessary for producers. So Theo became, it was very clear to me that I need to control the brand, control the messaging, because they also really wanted to educate consumers. I mean, there's, you know, people were thirsty for this kind of information, for this, for a way of doing business and understanding their products, um, but a way of doing business that maybe was different than this, this sort of like, don't look behind the curtain, folks. Everything's just fine over here. Keep buying Snickers bars and everything's going to be fine. As opposed to being fully transparent and saying, this is where your product comes from. This is who grows your food. This is how it's made. This is what goes into it. Because in doing so, you actually add value in people's minds. And there, there really is value add. So Theo retains much more of the market.
margin than I was able to do in my original business model and deliver that value back to the farmers, produce products that hopefully people like. What do you think of the root beer, by the way? Who tried the root? Did you try it yet? Any thoughts? Yeah, I liked it a lot. You can, you can be honest. I like those little root beer candies. So. Yeah, does it taste? It's better than I, I, I thought it was better than I expected it to be. Our product development folks came up with that, and I'm like, oh, come on. Yeah. And it was, I was really surprised. There's a few up here in case anybody wants some. Uh, so so that's, where, that's really where Theo came from. And I learned a lot of hard lessons along that way as far as, you know, if you talk about sustainability, um, you can't ha run a business focused on sustainability if it's not financially viable. And that was a very, very hard lesson for me to learn because I was so passionate about the mission, about changing lives. And the other thing that I just want to say is that the, it, for me, it... It started out initially as a concern for the environment, right? The carrying capacity of the land around the world is decreasing, meaning it's harder and harder for us to meet all of the needs that we have as a, as a planet. And I thought, well, there has to be a different environmental model, but you can't, you can't, I, I, I learned early that you can't focus on that without addressing the economic needs of the people who steward the land, of the producers. And when I first traveled to Africa, I thought I had seen poverty in Latin America. It was not, I was not prepared for what I encountered in West Africa in the early and mid 90s. It was, um, I, was, I was absolutely shocked. And these are cocoa, these were on cocoa farms that produce the majority of the industry. Most cocoa comes from Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, and Ghana, 60 plus percent of the world's cocoa. And these farmers were earning less than a dollar a day at the time. It's not that much better now. And, the, and because the business model for the chocolate industry, and this is true for a lot of soft commodity industries, and well, and some hard commodities as well, is that the cost of production is, is actually uh, not, it's not um, internalized, right? It's, it's externalized. So what you pay for that product is not what it really costs. Somebody somewhere has to bear the cost of that. And the cost is often poor nutrition, poor land stewardship, um, poor or no education for kids. Somebody pays the price. You know, there's something that they're not able to do because they don't make enough money to participate in the economy. And that kind of economic oppression became sort of the it was clear that I, there's no way I can start to address the environmental issues that I believe that we could through the cocoa industry without addressing the economic and people challenges at the time. And so that would, became a strong passion of mine. And I started to focus a lot on Africa, East and West Africa. Uh, it was about 2009. I was doing some work in Tanzania. And, um, and I'll get into some of the business stories for Theo in a minute. I'm, I'll stay focused on supply chain for a few more minutes. And does anybody have any questions yet, by the way? Okay, great. So um, in 2009, um, a, uh, as, as the dean shared, the majority of the cocoa that Theo used comes from uh, the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And if anyone knows anything about um, DRC, it's has been more or less a failed state after the genocide in Rwanda in the mid 90s. Um, that sparked war, um, especially in the east of the DRC, which ravaged the country. And today it still has the largest UN peacekeeping force on the planet. More than 5 million people killed because of war and disease over the last 20 years. It's, I mean, Syria is, is sort of clipping at the heels of DRC as far as the, the devastation, um, sadly. But DRC can, continues to have um, uh, problems with rebel groups, um, no government, uh, corrupt military, corrupt government, on and on and on. And uh, I had never been to DRC, and a friend of mine who knows our model, and the model that I developed with Thea was for farmers is that we would provide the technology and training if necessary to producers to increase the quality of the product they produce. And then based on the quality, we would pay a premium because just because you're poor doesn't mean that, you know, fair trade has, I, fair trade has a lot of limitations. I believe in the, the volition of fair, the fair trade movement, but the execution is often weak. And, and what I wanted to do was link the value of a product or a crop 
to the quality of it, right? What's, what is it worth to you? Because just because it's fair trade, if it doesn't taste good, you're not going to buy it again, I mean, right? I mean, you have to, it has to be something that, you're, that you enjoy and that you see value in. And so in the case of chocolate, it's about how good it tastes. Is it, some, is it a flavor that you're interested in? Is it a company you believe in? And so the model is we'll provide technology and training for farmers to improve their quality, and then we'll have a pricing ladder so that as your quality improves, the, the larger your premium is. And the incentive is significant. Sometimes double the price of what you could have on the pay or what you could receive on the conventional market. So a friend of mine said, hey, I'm working on this you know, with a, a new organization. They're just getting started. They know about your model. Would you be interested in um, talking to us? And, and the organization is trying to solve problems in the DRC. I said, it would be great. The founder of the organization, sorry to name drop, uh, it was kind of an interesting conversation. The founder of the organization was Ben Affleck, and he started the Eastern Congo Initiative. So he came over to Theo, and I was, I thought, well, you know, celebrity, Africa, this is a non starter. I mean, this isn't, but, you know, for my friend, I said, yeah, sure, we'll have the meeting. And I was really impressed with how intelligent he is and how committed he was at, to the cause and how much he understood about it. So I agreed to go to Congo, what many people consider to be one of the most difficult places to do work on the planet. And what I found there, and this, was the, this is the, the real story of resilience, what I found is communities of people who were so ready for change, so committed to change, so passionate about where they live and about their communities and wanting to participate in a positive way, um, I thought we would give it a try. And I have to confess, I've never had so much success in a supply development effort ever. In all of the countries I've worked throughout Central and South America and throughout East and West Africa, um, nothing comes close to what's happened in Congo, which is just absolutely a surprise, especially in the East, where it is so difficult um, to operate. But the reason is because the people have made the difference. And so we, so Theo now is impacting more than 5,000 families, more than 60,000 people. Um, the millions of dollars that we've pumped into the economy have had significant economic and political change in the communities where we are. And um, I see it as a real success story. I, you know, unfortunately, Theo doesn't talk a lot about this, which, you know, is something that I'd like to see change. Maybe in the future, uh, there will be more messaging around it. But the, you know, early on, we ran into some struggles. And this was a real testament to the, um, the integrity of the model that we had created. So the, the problem is in Eastern Congo is that there are these, these roving rebel or groups that are still there who have no true political agenda any longer. They're just trying to survive, and which means that they often create a lot of mayhem. Now, in some cases, the actual government is sponsoring some of this to try to keep the political environment in flux, which isn't obviously to anyone's best interest except theirs. But the combination of desperation and political motivation makes it a very unstable place. So 2013, we're in our second year, we're just starting to move towards having a, a significant amount of the cocoa that we use coming from Eastern Congo. And the, the primary community that we're buying from, almost 60,000 people, uh, rebels come out of the bush, the entire community flees into Uganda, and this is most of our supply chain, almost half of our supply chain at that point. I was, I thought, okay, well, you know, it's a good thing that we have plan B, C, and D, and we start looking at how we can move things around, and I wasn't sure what the future was, and, and often what happens in DRC is that when these kinds of disruptions take place, the people in the communities become the diaspora, right? They don't go, there's nothing to go back to. There's no economic engine. There's, they can start farming, you know, start growing some food somewhere else just as easily. Um, there's nothing to go back to. So, that, so I assume that all the work, everything we had done, likely is not going to um, bear any fruit. And certainly concerned about you know, the lives of the farmers we've de been depending on. The uh, UN finally, the UN peacekeepers finally get a combat mandate, which they did not have prior, meaning they couldn't fire their guns. And they get together with the um, FARDC, which is the Congolese army, and they push these rebels back into the, back into the bush enough so and create some security, enough so that if people wanted to come back, they could. And what, what happened 
Next, absolutely blew my mind. All of the people who had fled and they were in refugee camps in Uganda and northern DRC all came back. And the reason that they came back is because for the first time, they believed in their future. They saw what was actually possible because they had made money with cocoa. And they would say, well, cocoa is militia proof. It's rebel proof. And the reason is that you have to wait for it. It only has a couple times a year where you can harvest it. You have to process it. You have to know where to sell it. I mean, there's plenty of... of of uh, problems in the cocoa supply chain, but it's not a chicken, it's not a goat, it's not a crop that you can just take with you, it's not any personal goods you might have in your house that might do the, you know, these, the rebels good for a short time. And so they came back, and it was so clear to me that the model that we had been working on for so long actually did work. That that economic, that that belief that if we work hard, that tomorrow can be better than today. And that just fundamental idea is something that most of us have, right? Even in our lowest and darkest moments, we think, you know what? Pull it together, work hard, everything is going to be fine because we believe in the potential that we have. Well, imagine entire communities, imagine just, just millions of people who don't have that, who aren't certain of that. And so if there's one thing that I felt that we could try to do is not, we don't empower, I don't believe in the idea of empowering everyone. Everybody has their own power. What we do is we provide a tool that if someone chooses to, they can use it to try to have impact. And so it worked, it worked in DRC and today these communities, which you know, were on the run just a handful of years ago. Today, the premiums that we're paying in, part of them are being used to build a university. And now you have to understand, this is a place where m most of the children don't go to school. And the reason they don't go to school is because the parents say, why would we pay a school fee if there's nowhere for them to go? So what they learn, they're just going to come back here and, and do whatever farm work they can do. There, there's no future. There's nothing else for them. There's nothing for them to go to, to matriculate to. And the chief, and because it's still a very much a tribal community, the chief of the town, of the, of the region, said, well, if we can build a university and train these, these kids, provide access to education for agricultural, economic, business education, then the parents maybe have more incentive to pay the fees, which now they can afford because of the cocoa economy, pay the fees, send, to, send the kids to primary school so that they can go to the university and have the potential for a career beyond farming. And, and I have, I think farming is very noble, so it's not that, but the, and so seeing that happen and take, and, and then the government that is there started to support it. And, I've never, in, I've never in my career seen so much change so fast. And the, so the reason why DRC is because the people are the most resilient, most aggressive in creating change, intelligent, committed communities of people that I've ever met. And that is the, the recipe for success. So all of that, all of these people that I'm telling you that story about are in the chocolate bars that you have. I mean, this is their, this is their story. It's their success. You know, the flavor is in large part because of what they've been able to do and they've just been great partners for Theo. So you take all of this and you, know, you, can, you might, might have an idea of kind of where some of my passion lies. Well, there's another side of what I'm really invested in and that's on the consumer side and, the cons and in not telling people how to live their lives, but again, providing a tool, saying, here's an idea. You know, maybe this has some value. Maybe you're interested in this. And you know, we, did, um, uh, we run analytics on our uh, social media, and it's interesting. I, in talking to consumers, if we have a picture of a farmer um, and telling a great story about you know, Farmer Sally, and it's heartwarming, everybody loves that story, that will get you know, a certain number of hits. If we have a picture of a marshmallow with chocolate just melting all around it, it gets like a thousand times the number of hits, right? And, what we've, and it was very clear to us early on, if it doesn't taste good, nobody's going to care. I already shared that with you. One of the things that we found with most of the consumers who buy our products, they, you know, what they'll say is, oh, we love your chocolate and you're the good guys. And there are other people who know everything about us and will challenge us on our positions around labor and environmental stewardship and really like go deep on all of that stuff. 
But the, at the end of the day, if their thought, if the consumer's thought is, oh, well, you're the good guys, that's all that I need because it is about going as deep as you want to go, but it still has to taste good. And it, today, the way that information is being shared and the confusion that is, exists in the retail market, it's become so difficult to try to differentiate yourself from you know, your competition or to become important to consumers. And so how do you really do that? Today, the, and I'm not sure how many of you, I mean, how many of you go shopping at PCC? And how about uh, Fred Meyer, Kroger, not a lot, of, okay, more. Um, Whole Foods, online grocery. Okay, so there's, so most people go to Fred Meyer. Why is that? Can somebody tell me? Why do you like shopping at Fred Meyer? It's the price. Right? Do you buy organic products? And you don't have to tell me, but I'd be curious to know. No. Some people do, some people don't. But it's price. It's price driven, right? And price is absolutely critical. So when you go into PCC or Whole Foods, a little, it's a little bit lower in Fred Meyer, but not by much because their, their model is changing rapidly. More than half of the price that you pay is going to distribution and that retail expense. So if you buy a Theo chocolate bar for $3.60, Theo sells that on average for $1.53. That's what the manufacturer gets. And then from that, we have to figure out how to do all this good stuff and pay people salaries, et cetera. And consumers are understanding this. And the retail market and the way that information is shared about brands has fractured and is changing so rapidly that staying relevant as a brand is increasingly harder and the cost of doing business is higher. And so one of the things that we see coming next, and this is what I'm working on and I want to be sensitive to time, um, the, is we have to give consumers a reason why to care. And it's not, always, it's not always a combination of we're doing good in the world, please support us. Isn't this the most delicious chocolate marshmallow thing you've ever had in your life? It, it's, there's somewhere, it's the, the reason that consumers choose one brand over another is truly a phenomenon. Nobody really knows all of the architecture associated with why you might choose one brand and not choose another one. But it's, it is a series of influences. Um, advertising is considered to have some influence, but almost zero compared to your friends and family, which you know this is social media 101, right? Um, it is, it's not just the taste of the product, it's not, the, it's not just the associations that brand may have with other brands that you like, it's not just the story that you might have heard through a credible source, whether it's, you know, on NPR or 60 Minutes or some other news outlet. There's a variety of ways that consumers start to understand and appreciate a brand. And breaking that down, has, it has to have um, integrity. Because today, more than anything else, holding the delicious marshmallow aside, consumers can sniff out credibility and authenticity in a flash. And it's, one, it's, it's hard for a lot of people to decipher, and it's hard for brands. I've been in meetings with other companies. As uh, the Dean mentioned, I'm on the board of some other groups. I've, I do some consulting with other brands. I'm friends with a lot of different business leaders in the space. And the, they don't always know why one product or one brand is more successful. Price is a huge determiner. But if you're playing the game of price, it's a race to the bottom. It really is. If you're only buying when there's an orange tag, you've devalued your product in a heartbeat. What I'd rather do is have steady sales of a product that has a premium as opposed to just selling product when it's two for one. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I, I believe me. We sell, we have Bartels, um, if you guys know Bartels, they, uh, we sell a lot of product through there, and I've never seen them, I mean, they'll sell a chocolate bar for $1.99, and the volume that people buy is incredible. So I understand the sensitivity to price, but there needs to be another reason why you're doing that, and some brands break through and some brands don't. And so sorting that out is key, but what I will say, what we found at the heart of that is if you identify with the brand because of how the brand, can, the company conducts itself, and you believe that this is a fair representation of who you are, you share it with your friends, that is a, that is a huge 
advantage for a company. So decoding that is critical. But what that means is that the actions of the brand matter. And so transparency is something that is starting to increase. And transparency, not for the sake of being open, but for the sake of building trust. And the way the transparency is being shared is oftentimes, well, not as, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Genuine uh, as perhaps it could be. But the more authentic and transparent the brand is, the more likely it is that you're going to maybe buy it even when it's not on deal. When it is on deal, you may be buy more volume. So um, any questions? No questions? Yeah, oh, why do you have your factory here in Seattle? Um, so Seattle's always been my favorite part of the country. And it was in, what I didn't know at the time, and this was just luck, is uh, when we started, so I love living here and we wanted to do tours. And so we wanted to be in a place where, um, you know, people could come. And so that's why we started in Seattle. What really helped us a lot though, is that Seattle is a relatively small city in comparison to others. And especially at the time, it has a brand value. So if you do something in Seattle, you're more likely to get national press than if you're in a city of similar size elsewhere in the country. And so we were able to convert our local press into national press early on, and that had a huge impact on how the brand was built. But I, we're here because it's my favorite part of the country. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Um, like, how did you, like, you come back from like, 10 years? How do you yourself up when you that's a really good question. I've had some epic face, the question is how do I come back from failures? I've had some epic face plants. I really have. Um, the, you know, what I found, and this is, you know, this is very, very true um, for me personally, is that if, if I'm worried about how I look to others or my ego, I, you know, that's, that's, you'll, that's a rabbit hole that you'll get sucked down and you'll never come out. But if I, if I believe in what I'm doing and I learn from my mistakes, that's sort of the change. I mean, I, I personally really believe that my role on the, in the, on the planet is to be of service. Like I'm here to be of service, of to use my talents and my relationships and my experience to, um, to help other people, to do good things. And I believe in the model of business. Um, I believe in business because it's one of the most efficient ways for communities of people who choose to work together to go do something. You have more access to capital, it's, it, there's, and there's an edge to it that I think is valuable. But if I stay true and remember why it is that I have, why I do the work that I do, and I learn from my mistakes, and I admit my mistakes, you know, then you heal from whatever the event was and you stay true to yourself and your integrity remains intact. Does that answer, answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what, what is one aspect of business that you wish you would know about when you first started the astronomers? Oh. Huh. Um, well, there's, this is something that sort of changes with time and has some laws associated. Um, I, I wish that I had taken a step back at the very beginning and was more curious and looked more broadly about financing options, how to finance a business. Today, there's actually a lot more options than there were then as far as the way things can be structured. Um, but that's what I wish I, I wish I had said, okay, well, wait a second. What is it that I want to build? And what is the right sort of motivation for the money that I'm bringing in? And so that's, so being clear, being really clear, and you can't always know, right? You can't always know. I'm working on a new business concept with my son who's 22. And, um, and I, I'll say, so, you know, what do you want in the future? Like, what do you want to see? Like, he's like, you know, he's like five years is a quarter of my life. I have no idea, you know, like I can't see that far ahead. But he says, these are the things that are important to me. And then based on that, you make the best decision you can. But I, my, I wish that I had been more curious or believed. I wish I'd been a little bit more curious about what financing options there were and how that links back to 
what kind of goals I want. So imagine the future more and apply that to how you stu structure something at the beginning. Uh, is Theos the only company you're involved with and do you plan on uh, branching out to anything else? Yeah, so I have, so I'm the founder of Theo, and up until last fall was a CEO. I stepped aside because I, in large part, I mean, there are several factors, but in large part because I want a broader platform to do the kind of work that I've been sharing some stories with you about today. And um, there are other companies that I've, I advise. Um, I'm on the, the uh, Net Impact, which is a organization that, is focused on um, equipping leaders of the future with tools that they need to build a more just and sustainable world. Um, so I get involved in a variety of different businesses, but what I really want is to create a, 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 a new platform for engaging with consumers and having impact. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When working internationally and come across cultural or ethical differences, um, that kind of change how you do business? Yeah, so uh, there's a, well, it, I think the, let me put it this way. I feel, this is per, my personal opinion. Um, so yes, I've come across a wide variety of different cultures and cultures that don't share my values. It's a different culture, right? And I believe everybody gets to believe what they want. Um, the... And, and so I think being humble and sensitive to other people's experience, no matter who they are, no matter what, where you are here, right here, right now, um, I, is, well, you'll be more successful because you'll see more options, but I'll tell you one short story in uh, Congo. So the way that the, um, the, way that the community um, uses, so the money that we pay goes in part to uh, the premium, I should say, a uh, significant portion goes to farmers, but then there's a small part that goes for community purposes, and the community gets to decide how that money is spent. And so one of the issues um, that the fair trade community has, which it rightfully so, is on gender, and you know having more of a gender balance. And there are, in this particular community in DRC, um, gender is not balanced at all. It's very, it's, you know, it's a very, you know, sort of patriarchal society. And so we're there, and I'm with um, some other uh, um, organizations who look at gender issues and look at a variety of different labor issues because we're doing a small tour. And we're meeting with all the leaders of the community who are responsible for this fair trade premium. And it's all men. And so one woman who's with a delegation says, um, do you have any women on this committee making decisions? And one man says, yes, we do have one woman. And, he said, and she said, well, where is she? Oh, well, she's on the farm working. And <laughs> of course, the delegation wasn't thrilled with this, but it's a reality, right? And this is not, you know, my, we explained why we believe that empowering, not empowering, but to, to make sure that women are at the table is good for the, you know, we shared, like, these are all of the reasons why why we believe this is important. And at the end of the day, I'm signing the check. So they say, well, if, if Joe wants us to elect more women, then we will basically so that this business continues. And there was an interesting debate about why we got even deeper into why that matters. You know, where, and so you could start to see a small shift, but we're talking, you know, I mean, generations. I mean, in this country today, you know, we're 50 years after the, um, uh, after the voting acts, right? In the, it's, today we're still struggling, right? So this is, even though that we planted a seed at that meeting, Theo and anybody else will have to live with those, that difference for some time. And again, I, I don't believe it's my job to import um, uh, values on anyone, but we certainly have what we think is important. And if we're using this cocoa, we want to ensure everyone as well. So there's a lot of that. There's a lot of differences, not just gender issues, and it's it's delicate. Other questions? Yeah. You mentioned that your product um, developers came up with a root beer flavor. Has yes. there been a flavor that you thought of, and is there a story behind? Oh yeah, there's. <laughs> Um, so my tastes are, um, my tastes are a little, I don't say they're extreme, they're, they're curious, adventuresome. 
And my one, there are two products that I that are still to this day my favorite. One is a um, a truffle, as in like black or white truffle. You know the mush, the fungus. Um, a truffle caramel, which is amazing. It's not a huge seller. It's <laughs> delicious. And uh, the other is what's actually it's sort of similar to the root beer is a black licorice chocolate. I love black licorice and it actually compare what surprisingly so but neither one of those have been like top sellers yeah yeah and there's there I have to say if you spend time over in the store there's a lot of really innovative fun flavors so I would encourage you to check it out yeah uh, I was gonna ask you said you pay a premium for like higher quality chocolate do you guys like are you able to assign a numerical um, like measurement to yes. like chocolate and how like what goes into that? Yeah, so so we're so we buy the cocoa beans, right? The raw material, and then we make the chocolate. And the and so the way the to make sure that it's as fair as possible, there are there are there are several factors that go into quality, but two that are really important are the level of fermentation. So. When cocoa is harvested, it is, there's this white pulp, this mucilage around it that's very high in sugar. You pile that up, and as that breaks down, it ferments using natural airborne yeast. And, that, and fermenting really well is important for the quality of the product. So the percentage of fermentation is one. So if you have 100 beans, the higher that percentage of well-fermented beans, which you can visually look at, it's not just taste. You can cut the bean in half, it's very common, and say, oh, well, that's well fermented. And we would train people in, throughout the supply chain on how to do that. So the higher the percentage of fermentation, the higher the quality, typically, and that's easy to measure. The other is bean size. So you have a cocoa bean, which is the size of the almond. Of that cocoa bean, almost 20% of it is waste. The shell is... Um, uh, Twelve percent. There's about six to seven percent moisture, and so the larger the bean, the higher the yield, the production yield. So we also look at bean size because the bigger the beans are, the low, less waste we have, the more efficient our production is. Real economic impact. So those two factors together drive the premium. Yeah. What's the competition for the jobs you offer, like? Well, there aren't any. I mean, that's sort of the challenge because, you know, these are, so the, so what we do is we buy from farmers who are small independent farmers. So there may be, I'm trying to think, there's um, some grow vanilla, but that's not really competition. Uh, some grow a tree that the bark is used to make quinine, but they don't really compete. We encourage a diversified landscape so you can grow cocoa, vanilla, other crops as well. Um, and we would actually like to see more competition in the region just in general. The other, the jobs that we work with an exporter who is community based and they hire agronomists to provide whatever training is necessary for farmers, collect the cocoa, process, you know, bag it, ship it. And those jobs are, um, you know, there's probably, well, about 200 people employed in this one particular region, in Eastern Congo through that work, but there's not, a lot of, there's not a lot of other economic activity there right now. Mark? Uh, you talk about how hard it is for brands to kind of break through right now, and kind of understand what's gonna hit with a consumer. And if I'm understanding your story correctly, though, it almost is like you're predicting a future where you have to do it all. You have to have a high quality product, you have to be authentic and transparent, and you have to be morally or ethically good. Uh, do you think that's true? Do you think that's where I, we're headed? I do. I mean, you guys might, um, I do. And if uh, there's a, the number of new products coming, and this is not just in food. I mean, a, the number of new products is absolutely daunting. I was, um, do you guys know Lush, the company Lush? I'm a huge fan of Lush, and I spent a lot of time with their, their leadership. And I was in London um, last, in, actually in February, and every year they do a summit. Um, and it's for employees only. I felt honored to be there. Um, Several thousand people there. They have about 30,000 they employ. And Lush is, is the real deal. I, I support them all day long. I encourage you to. They walk their talk in, in a very real way. So there, every single thing, whether it's cork for their boxes, um, whether they engage in digital ethics, um, gender rights, 
Um, cocoa, the reason I know them so well is cocoa butter is a very large ingredient that they buy and they, they're actually now sourcing for North America their cocoa butter from the Congo work that I've shared, which was a huge success. And they know, and, and for them, it's about doing the right thing. They believe in that. But the lift that they get from, from consumers is absolutely huge. And so new brands today have, they have to fire on all cylinders. If you're, go, uh, if you're going to have, if you're going to capture people's attention, because there are so many alternatives out there. And so you do, I, you do have, and the other thing I wanted to say is that if you look at um, the Edelman, which is a global PR firm, they do a trust barometer every year. And if you look at that, you can start to see the word purpose is used, and I understand how it's used. Um, the, but they, if, you are not, if, you, if you're not focused on the impact that you're having, whether it's in your supply chain, your community, your workforce, consumer, beyond, if you're not focused on that and if you're not moving towards transparency, um, it's going to be hard to compete. The, 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 my last word on that point is that I think of um, historically consumer brands were two-dimensional, right? It was a product that... Um, you liked at a price that you thought was fair for that product, right? It's 2D. Today it's three-dimensional. It has to be a price you, at a price you believe is fair for the product. You have to love the product. And you also have to know that that product is making some sort of contribution beyond just, you know, the cookie tastes good. It has to have a broader impact. And it's, it's inescapable. Every, every company today has, is uh, trying to address this one way or another that I know of. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? All right, so I'm gonna just leave you with, with sort of one last thought. Um, the, so today retail is in disarray, right? Many of you might know that. You know, peop, um, uh, companies are leaving bricks and mortar right and left. You hear all these stories, and why wouldn't they, right? Amazon, to me, is a utility company. You know, it's just, uh, it's a product that's there fast, it's cheap, it's your size, done, right? You don't really think about it. I don't know a lot of people who are invested in the Amazon brand. Some are, I'm sure, but I don't know a lot who are. And, um, and grocery is going, in that, is going in that direction very quickly. If you look at all of the moves that the large grocery companies have made, you know, it's because their stock price is, is, is not doing as well. They're pushing a lot of the cost of business back onto the brands that sell through, so making it harder to do business there. Um, and when we think about how we meet our needs, their needs, you know, there, there's still this component of wanting to have impact, wanting to have quality, but there's a social opportunity that certain companies are starting to understand where retail itself is more of an experience. The way that you, the way that I think about it, and others have said this, this isn't just my tagline, is that really what, what the best retail is now, it's an experience and they're selling stories, right? Selling uh, something that you can share. You have an experience that you want to share with your friends or your family. You have a story to tell about your experience. And when you do that, there's an opportunity to create a connection, not just with the people who may be buying your products um, or who are selling them to you, but also other people who are involved in that. And so I see commerce and business not as purely transactional. At the end of the day, the, you know, money needs to turn, right? You, we all need to pay rent. Um, but it's really not truly transactional. It's, there's an opportunity for the way that we meet our needs to be um, more engaging, more collaborative. And so I'm working on, the, on a, what is ultimately a retail concept on how to engage people in a way and have consumers actually help drive within a certain set of guardrails business activity, right? Where there really is truly an exchange that's happening. And um, it's something that, you know, a year from now, I'd love to come back here and talk to you about because I do think that the, it is changing and I have no interest in competing with Amazon, but I do have an interest in providing experience or, or, or experiencing with shoppers um, a new way of being together and having positive impact. So I hope you'll have me back. Thank you.